Hello, and welcome to our show, Fade In, presented by the Carnegie Screenwriters. I'm your host, Bob Scott. Joining us today, we have Lawrence Connolly. Lawrence is a, an author, a writer, a screenwriter, a musician, a bard, a storyteller. This man does it all. Right. So, Lawrence, thank you so much for being here with us today. My pleasure. It's a pleasure to thank have you. you. Yeah, so you are all those things and probably more. Let's talk a little bit about your roots, though. They're here in Pittsburgh. You were born here? That's right. I was born in Oakland. Oakland, huh? But then um, you spent some time on the other side of the state as a kid growing up, we correct? Moved over, we moved to Philadelphia when I was uh, seven years old and um, uh, grew up on the outskirts of Philadelphia and um, uh, had the opportunity to grow up in, uh, in true middle America, you know, uh, Levittown, Pennsylvania, uh -huh. um, which, um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a strange uh, existence for a child, very insular, and, uh, and yet it was the place that we always saw on television, mm -hmm. you know, Ozzie and Harriet, right. Leave it to Beaver. It was all in places like that. We thought the whole world looked like that. And so we ended up looking for excitement in the shadows. And, uh, and so that was when my desire to, to tell stories and, and to find stories that were beyond the norm really started, I think. Just the desire to, to find a way out of the normalcy. Yeah, and uh, for you younger viewers out there, uh, Google or check out TV Land for some of the references he's making, right. but I remember them. I, we're of an age, so. Um, now, as a, as a young kid there, you went to the movies, and certainly you were influenced by a lot of the, uh, the films of the time, the monster movies, the uh, creature features, and um, I believe, actually, you have a video explaining that. Isn't that correct? That's right. It takes you through the whole, the whole arc of my life in about uh, three and a half minutes. <laughs> uh, and um, yeah, we could take a look at that and we could talk about it. And what's it called? It's called The Golden Age of Scary Stories. Golden Age of Scary Stories with Lawrence Connolly. We'll take a look at that right now. It'll kind of right. lead us right down the path here. It's been said that the Golden Age is 12. The mind is partly formed not yet encumbered by the pressures of adolescence. Not surprisingly, the things that we fixate on then tend to become lifelong passions. For me, it was scary movies. At first it was movies about big things, the giant monsters that occasionally came lumbering across the black and white RCA console while I was growing up on the outskirts of Philadelphia. Back then, the New York station, WOR, ran Million Dollar Movie, showing the same movie all week multiple times each day, providing the opportunity to binge watch a favorite monster movie to the point where the images became part of my DNA. But such fascinations weren't limited to the small screen. In 1961, when the giant monster movie Gorgo had its world premiere at the Philadelphia Fox Theater, my dad took us to town, where we entered the theater beneath a marquee topped by a twenty-foot likeness of the monster, complete with flashing red eyes. For a kid, it didn't get better than that. So, the first great thing about scary movies? Giant monsters. But a bigger thrill came on September 16, 1963, just ahead of my twelfth birthday. That's when ABC debuted the science fiction horror hybrid, The Outer Limits. But the monsters here weren't giants. Some, like this genetically altered monkey from The Architects of Fear, could fit inside a box. Some were insect size, and others mere manifestations of an out-of-balanced mind. An epitome of this later form of fear debuted on my birthday, October 2nd, 1959. It was the premiere episode of another anthology series, Rod Serling's Twilight Zone. Where is everybody centers on a mind experiment gone terribly wrong. That's the second great thing about scary movies, the monsters inside us. 
Fittingly, when I started writing, some of my first stories appeared in Rod Serling's Twilight Zone magazine with Mrs. Haftbuger's basement and echoes offering scares that are extensions of the mind. And here the story comes full circle, with echoes being optioned for film and being produced twice as indie films. I continue to be fascinated by cinematic monsters. Indeed, a project that I recently worked on with David Slade is the segment of an anthology film titled Nightmare Cinema, which takes some of my own monsters and projects them onto the screen to scare the hell out of a new generation of impressionable viewers. That's the third great thing about scary movies. They're an outlet for my own dark imaginings. I'm Lawrence C. Connolly. I write scary stories. I'll see you in the darkness. So, I mean, we want to talk about nightmare cinema and your experiences with that, but let's get back a little bit to um, your, your roots as a writer. We saw how you were inspired by these horror movies and television right. shows and sci-fi, but uh, as far as the writing, um, what is this what kind of led you into that? You, you had these stories that you wanted to tell, so you, you decided to write? Yeah, I, I think it's, um, as I said, it's um, looking for a way out of the normalcy. Mm -hmm. Looking for the adventures. Where are the adventures? And uh, Twilight Zone and Outer Limits, uh, the television shows from the 1950s and 60s, um, those were important in my development as a writer. Uh, those Twilight Zone stories gave me a sense of um, the exposition, the development, the, the, the crazy idea, and the twist at the end, and the twist that had to play fair, because the twist couldn't come out of nowhere. Right. Uh, it had to be something that was anticipated from the beginning. And so those two television shows, in a way, gave me the sensibilities that I was, that became the kind of stories that I would tell. And you started out writing short stories? Started out writing short stories. Of course, it was, it was a while later um, that I started submitting them, but um, we had a, um, a newspaper, uh, the Levittown Times, and they had a place on the comic page where they would publish stories sent in by kids. Mm -hmm. So those are my first publications, not my first sales. They didn't pay anything for them. But um, I, I wrote some strange stories for that. But it was years later when I actually began to entertain the possibility of really writing for publication. And this was in the late 70s and early 80s. And even though the television shows were instrumental in getting me to think about these kind of stories, I didn't start out writing scripts, started out writing stories for the magazines. It was a good time to start. There, was a, there were a lot of science fiction and fantasy and mm -hmm. horror magazines out at the time, and they were paying good money, and the editors were interested in cultivating new writers because, of course, writers go through, went, at that time, they went through the magazines as short story writers, and then they would move on and become novelists, so the editors always had to restock the right, supply right. Of, uh, of short story writers. So back then in the professional magazines, if you had a little bit of ability and you could put together a, a manuscript that, that looked professional, that looked like you knew what you were doing, the editors would take time um, to nurture the writers. And there was an editor at the time, I believe it was the editor of Isaac Asimov's science fiction magazine, who uh, said that uh, the best correspondence school out there is the magazines. You don't pay any tuition. Uh, and the graduation is that you actually sell something mm -hmm. and you make money uh, as a result. So um, these editors uh, nurtured me along. When I first got, in, got started, I decided I would give myself a year. I would write a story every month. I would send every story out. I would keep it out until it's sold. And if a, year, if a year goes by and I don't sell anything, then we reevaluate. 11 months. <laughs> 11 months in the first story, the story I sold very first, sent it out, got rejected, came back again, I sent it out again. Um, it's finally sold 11 months later. Uh -huh. And the beauty of that was at that point, 
I had 10 other stories that were already finished. And so what I did is as those stories came back, rejected from the other magazines, you can bet where I sent them, I sent them to that editor. And that was the editor of Amazing Stories. And Amazing Stories just happens to be the first science fiction magazine ever. They started publishing in 1926. And so uh, in the uh, early 80s, uh, I got to be part of that, uh, that group. That's where it began. <laughs> and here's an interesting thing, too. Um, and this is you know, a good thing for uh, young writers to keep in mind, is that you, you just keep at it. You, right, don't, you don't stop right. because you get a rejection. And um, when that editor at Amazing Stories finally rejected one of those stories, said, ah, oh, this isn't right for us, I sent it to a new magazine, and that was the magazine that had just started publishing, which was Rod Serling's Twilight Zone magazine, which was the spin-off of the television show. Mm -hmm. And that became, that rejected story was my first sale there. And that story went on to be picked up at the end of that year by a book titled Year's Best Horror Stories. So you send those rejections <laughs> out because yeah. you never know. Never give up. It might just connect. Keep writing, keep That's plugging it. away, right? It's a darn good story, too. Yeah. <laughs> so you, you wrote, obviously, a lot of short stories and novels. Um, but you, at some point, you kind of made the progression into scriptwriter. That's right. And at, at what point was that? In 2000, I got an email from a screenwriter in the UK. His name was Charlie Cantor. And Charlie at that time had done a couple of films. One was a fairly successful cult film in England called Blood. And it was about a, uh, a woman whose blood is addictive. So it was kind of a, um, a flip on the vampire story. So this was not a story about a monster that was compelled to drink people's blood, but it was a story about one person that people are compelled to drink her blood. Mm -hmm. And um, that was his second film. He wrote and produced and directed that one. And... Um, his film before that was titled Appetite. So I had heard of these. I had heard of these films. And so when I get this e email from Charlie Cantor, I said, well, that, that name looks familiar. And Charlie, in his email, said that his friend, David Slade, had picked up a copy of Borderlands 3, which was an anthology that had published one of my stories, in a London bookstore. And he'd read my story, Traumatic Descent, and he thought it would make a terrific film. And at that point, David was making MTV videos, and he was interested in branching out into features. And Charlie had made two feature films, and he was interested in focusing on screenwriting. So David and Charlie decided that Traumatic Descent was going to become the story that they would work on to become David's first feature film. And Charlie came to America. He came and visited me. He stayed here for 10 days. We spent those 10 days talking about the story, brainstorming it, thinking about ways that we could open it up into a feature. And uh, then he went back to the UK and wrote the first draft. Now, I didn't write this one. I collaborated on the, I d was involved in the brainstorming. I had written the story, but Charlie took charge of producing the screenplay. When he produced the first draft, I was invited to England uh, to go there and, uh, and meet with David, meet with the producers, and uh, we had another marathon session where we talked about the story, we talked about ways it could go. So even though I wasn't hands-on writing the screenplay, I was very much involved mm -hmm. in the development of it. And uh, Charlie produced a second draft, and he died tragically young mm. uh, of cancer, and he passed away right about the time that David Slade was coming to the States, to Hollywood, to begin work in feature films. And at that point, the story was still under option. The, um, uh, the, the screenplay was still in play, but uh, David's first movie ended up being Hard Candy. Terrific film. Um, and the thought was then, this way to, or at this point we were calling the, the story Traumatic Descent, This Way to Egress. It had been retitled at that point and um, it was going to become his second feature. 
Second feature ends up being 30 Days of Night. We <laughs> hoped it was going to be the third. Third is Twilight Eclipse, and it kept, keeps going. And right around 2010, I was in LA, uh, I was at David's house, um, and I, I was in town for his wedding, and we were talking late into the night, and we pretty much agreed at that point that doesn't look like this film is going to get made. And so I kind of held out hopes that it might be, but in 2015, out of the blue, uh, David calls and he says, we have production money to do it as a short, as part of a project that Mick Garris is working on called Nightmare Cinema. Would you like to collaborate on the screenplay? Absolutely. So what David did is, uh, is he did the first pass, he went back to the story, and he took the dialogue from the story, the action from the story. And the agreement was we were gonna take all of the backstory out, all that stuff that we brainstormed mm -hmm. and we put in over those meetings when Charlie was here and, and I went to the UK and visited with Charlie. And this was when it was planned to be a feature. Yeah, that was, yeah. we took all that backstory out. We went right back to the bones of the story. And then we even went a step further and we took out the flashbacks. Just tell the story in real time and let the audience pick up on the backstory. That was the plan, and that's what ends up on the screen in Nightmare Cinema. And at this point, you're 15 years into, yeah. into what had started out uh, to be this feature film. That's right. So it's taken that long so far. That's right. And you're still in the writing process. That's it. Yeah. And, um, uh, but you asked, uh, you know, how did I get into uh, writing scripts? I actually had written a few scripts before that, and uh, in one in particular I wrote based on one of my stories, Prime Time, and it's a time travel story, and this is because David thought it might make a good short film, so he said, you know, uh, would you be interested in doing a uh, screenplay on it? I did. Um, he never directed it, so that screenplay is now in pre-production in New York City. Oh. And uh, so that, I guess, was probably the first one that, uh, the first screenplay that I wrote that I had picked up. But now, let me ask you this. Sure. Um, what do you find to be maybe the major difference or differences between, say, oh, writing yeah. a short story or a novel and then trying to write a screenplay? Well, the big difference is that you can't explain or you shouldn't explain anything in the screenplay. No voiceover. I mean, some films have voiceovers, but mostly there aren't there. You let the action, the scene, uh, the, the actors, Show, the don't tell, angles. right? That's Show, right. don't tell. That's it. Yeah. And so everything has to convey the sort of thing that in a story or a novel, the narrator might have a chance to comment on. I find this very liberating because knowing that it's not an option, really have to focus on what the character is doing, uh, what the scene looks like, um, where the camera is going to be placed. You know, of course, that, that's the director's uh, decision. But uh, as I'm writing the screenplay, that's in my mind. You know, where would the camera be placed here? So um, here's an interesting story. There is a scene in This Way to Igris. And I think we'll, we're going to look at a clip from right. This Way to Igris in just a minute. But um, there is a scene, and it's right toward the climax of the story. It, it is. It's the build-up to the climax. And the build-up to the climax is the protagonist standing in a hallway in front of a translucent glass window. And she can see the shadows uh, of three people behind that translucent glass window. And they're talking. And that's the scene. It goes on for about three or four pages. And it worked just fine in the story. And we kept it in the screenplay. But the day before we were going to film, I mentioned to David, you sure you don't want me to add something in there? <laughs> uh, he said, no. He says, we're gonna let the story show itself. We're going to rely on, uh, we relied on the director, the scene designer, the actor to make this happen. And uh, it's riveting. What David and, uh, and the performers did with this is remarkable stuff. And it's really a lesson in what the show don't tell right. can accomplish 
even when all that we're showing is shadows through a translucent glass window. And it shows the importance, too, of, of relying on that team. You're writing the script, but the script is really a blueprint. That's it. You know, it goes to the hands of the, like you said, the producers, yeah. the director, the, you know, the cinematographer, the uh, set designers, everybody that's involved to bring that to life, you know, right. special effects people, whatever it might be, so, yeah. So, it's a collaboration. Yes, it is. And, and we don't know, um, in, is, writing stories is much the same way. We don't know when we put it on the page how the reader is going to decode it. And we don't know when we write the script just how the performer, the scene designer, the, uh, uh, the, the person who scores the scene, mm -hmm. um, how all of this is going to come together. But we rely on everyone to do the job. And even if it's just one person reading a book, we rely on that person to do the job. But we have to meet them. We, we have to give them the stuff to work with, <laughs> or it doesn't work at all. Right. Well, you, you were just describing, you know, working on on this part of Nightmare Cinema, your, your segment, uh, This Way to Agris, right? So we do have the clip you said. Yes. So let's take a look at that, and then maybe we can talk a little bit more sure, about Sure, I, I should probably set it. it up a little bit and, sure, uh, yes, please and do. Just, just let you know that, uh, that what we're going to see is, uh, is, is an excerpt that the main character is Helen, and, uh, and Helen is having a rough day. Um, the world is beginning to degrade around her. She doesn't quite know why. In the back of her mind, she knows that something traumatic has happened to her, but she doesn't want to face it. She's kind of tuning it out. But this thing is festering in the back of her mind. It's affecting her emotions. It's affecting the way she views the world. And so when we pick up on this scene, uh, Helen is walking through the hallway of an office building, and she hears the ding of an elevator and she begins to move toward it and she sees this figure move into the an elevator and we can we see it from the back first and we get a sense that something's not right here and then when it turns around and faces her we really get the sense mm -hmm. so what we're seeing in this scene um, the person that Helen confronts um, the look of the hallway uh, as it's been degraded and it's, it's covered with mold um, all of these are possibly perceptions of Helen's view of the world. Or possibly, the world is actually literally degrading around her. At this point, we don't know that yet. Well, let's take a look. All right. <laughs> My children? What children? My children. Sorry, honey. I haven't seen any children. Yeah. <laughs> I should have mentioned that um, what she, she's looking for her children and that, that what she's just done is that she has uh, left the doctor's office and um, uh, this is a psychologist who is you know, trying to help her and um, she returns to the waiting room. And when we see those couches covered in mold, and we see that, um, that, that, that really grotesque, uh, dark uh, picture uh, behind the reception area, um, that is um, all the things in the waiting room that have been kind of turned on their head mm -hmm. since the first time we saw it. So she's, um, she's searching for her children in this strange place. They have vanished from the waiting room. The waiting room has changed, and uh, she needs to now search this um, closed down office building because it's now after hours and, um, and try to find them mm -hmm. as the hallways and rooms degrade around her. Well, that was uh, quite, quite creepy and very chilling. So I can't wait to see the entire thing. And that is part of an anthology. There are how many other 
segments or, or vignettes. Yes, there, in it. there are a total of five. Mm -hmm. And uh, the remarkable thing about this film, and uh, this is really kudos to Mick Garris for putting this together. Um, Mick Garris got together five of the most interesting and important directors of horror today Alejandro Burgess, Joe Dante, Rahui Kitamura, David Slade, and himself. And each one was given free reign to develop an episode for Nightmare Cinema. And uh, it was basic, yeah. basically, he went to them and said, your dream project, let's do it. <laughs> yeah. And you've got quite a cast, too. That's right. Um, we just saw uh, Elizabeth Reiser from uh, The Haunting of Hill House. And uh, Mickey Rourke is in it, Richard Chamberlain. It's, um, yeah, it's got a terrific cast, and everybody is remarkable in it. And Mickey Rourke is the projectionist, I guess is his title. It kind of ties all this together. That's right. Um, the protagonist of each one of these stories um, finds herself or himself in this theater. And what he does is he screens films that could be something that happens to them. It hasn't happened yet. But this could be where your life is going. And um, they watch them, and uh, then, with, then they have to deal with them after they're over. So Nightmare Cinema is now out at it is. selected theaters? It's, uh, it's, it opened in selected theaters across the country uh, June 21st. And it's also available uh, video on demand. And then already for pre-order uh, at Amazon. This stuff happens fast these yeah. days, doesn't oh my it? Gosh, yes. uh, it's coming out on the twenty-third. No, the third, the third of September, on uh, Blu-ray and DVD. And then right around Halloween, just in time for Halloween, it's going to be streaming on AMC's Shutter platform. Uh -huh. So lots of opportunities to see Fantastic. it. Fantastic! Can't wait to see it. And uh, you check it out too. This guy is scary, I'm telling you. <laughs> <laughs> he may not look it, but he's a scary guy. Thank you very well, much. Well, Lawrence, it's been a pleasure interviewing you, sitting here and chatting with you, and uh, I'm sure you all enjoy it, so thanks for being here. You're welcome. It's been my <laughs> pleasure. And thank you for tuning in. Thanks to uh, Carnegie Screenwriters and everybody here at PCTV. And until the next time, watch out for this guy in the darkness. I'll see you in the darkness. Pleasant dreams. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.